Okay, George Barclay has a very unique uh, argument for the existence of God, and God plays a very important role in Barclay's philosophy, which may not be surprising since Barclay ended up as a, a bishop in the Church of Ireland. Okay, here's how the argument starts. It starts from the nature of our ideas. The first premise that he says, he states is this, ideas don't cause anything. Now he thinks that this is going to be obvious. He says that a little attention will discover to us that the very being of an idea implies passiveness and inertness in it, insomuch that it is impossible for an idea to do anything, or strictly speaking, to be the cause of anything. So he thinks that's just obvious. Premise two is the changes in our ideas are either caused by ideas or by a substance. Now, here's the idea, here's the thought. Uh, your ideas, both your sensory ideas and your imaginations and your memories and your choices, all the things that are in your head, those things change all the time. And his question is, what causes the changes in my mental contents? Why, why do those things happen? And the only two options, and his, given what he's argued so far, is that ideas can either be caused, changes in ideas can either be caused by other ideas or by a substance, because that's all that there is in the world. But he's just arguing in premise one that ideas aren't going to cause anything. And that means that it follows premise three, that a substance must be what causes the changes in our ideas. Why do my thoughts change? My perceptions change? My will change? Because a substance causes it to. So then the question is, what kind of substance causes the changes in my ideas? The changes that happen in my mind all the time. And he says, well, in the first place, uh, the, the substance that causes those changes has to be a spirit. Why? Because only substances are spirits. He's already proven that the only substances that exist in the world are minds. There are no material objects out there. So... That it follows that the changes in my ideas are caused by a spirit of some kind. So that's the first, the first chunk of the argument. Now the question this raises is, which spirit, which mind, causes the changes that I experience in my ideas? Is it my own spirit that does it? Or is it some other spirit that is acting on me and causing the changes in my ideas from the outside? And he's going to argue it's the latter. Here's how it goes. He says, ideas which I cause are under my voluntary control. Here's what he means by that. Um, if I'm the cause of an idea, that means I can choose to think of it whenever I want. For example, I can choose right now to think of unicorns. So anything that I can like imagine in my mind, I can control that. But I can't control all of my ideas. In particular, he says in premise 7, my sensory perceptions are not under my voluntary control. So right now, you can try not to hear my voice, but unless you plug your ears, you're going to hear it. Um, in the same way, you know, if you are crossing the street and you look and you see a Mack truck coming towards you, you can't just wish it away. That sensory perception is there whether you want it to be or not. So sensory perceptions, he wants to say, are not under your voluntary control. And what does that mean? Well, that 6 and 7 imply, as he says in 8, that I do not cause my own sensory perceptions because they're not under my voluntary control. What that means then is that there's some other spirit with some other will that produces my ideas, my sensory perception ideas, not all my ideas, but my sensory perceptions must be caused by some other spirit because it's not me that's causing them. I can't control them. All right, so some other spirit exists and causes my sensory perceptions. Now he wants to ask, what is that other spirit like? Like, what can I say about the other spirit? What can I know about the other spirit which is causing all of my sensory perceptions? Well, uh, in order to, to figure out what we can about this other spirit, we can make inferences from its effects. All right, so premise 10 says, what kind of perceptions is this other spirit causing in my mind? 
Well, the sensory ideas that it causes are stronger and livelier and more distinct than those which humans cause in their own imaginations. Think about this. When you see a tree, you have a sensory perception of a tree. Isn't that going to be a stronger, livelier, clearer idea than any idea of a tree which you can just imagine on your own? Yeah. I mean, you can all the stuff that you can invent, it's just all kind of hazy uh, in comparison with sensory perception ideas. Well, what that means then is that the spirit that is causing your sensory perceptions must be a non-human spirit since it's causing things, causing ideas which no human can cause. It's causing ideas which are stronger and livelier than any that mere humans can cause voluntarily in, in their imaginations. Okay, so now we know that the cause of our sensory perceptions is a spirit that is not a human. It's like bigger and more powerful than a human. Furthermore, in premise 12, he says, those sensory ideas that we have occur in a regular train or series. So, you know, when you have a dream or when you have a daydream or when you have imaginations, you can like make stuff happen in a crazy order. It's chaotic. But when you open your eyes and you have sensory perceptions, those are occur in a regular, predictable pattern. The sun's going to rise every 24 hours. Every time you drop something, it's going to fall towards the center of the earth at 9.86 meters per second. Um, you know, things don't just pop in and out of existence as you are looking at them or something like that. So they occur, sensory ideas occur in this very regular, highly intricate uh, way that we experience the natural world around us. And what that indicates, according to Barclay, is that whatever spirit is causing our sensory ideas must be incredibly wise in order to be able to um, cause such an intricately regular patterned uh, series of perceptions in us. And also benevolent. Benevolent means good. Why does he say that that spirit must be good? Oh, because we have so many good sensory perceptions and our, our sensory perception of the world is orderly and allows us, makes it possible for us to navigate through life. We know that when we have the sensory perception of eating bananas, it's going to be nourishing. And when we have the sensory perception of eating cyanide, it's going to be um, you know, poisonous to us. So the order and construction of our sensory perceptions makes them predictable and allows us to navigate through the world in a way uh, that is good for us. So that means that whatever spirit is designing the whole setup of sensory perceptions must be good as well as wise. So this spirit who is very, very wise and very benevolent and is not us, we can call, that's what, that's Barclay says we can call that God. Okay. Now, how does this work out in real life? As I said before, he explains that the regularity and the order of the sense ideas that God produces in us allows us to make predictions that, that will guide our lives. So um, we are living in the matrix that God made, if you will. That's one way to think about it. Now, at the end here, or in section 33, um, Barclay draws a distinction which you may find surprising. You may think, Barclay doesn't believe in real things, does he? He only believes in ideas. In one sense, that's true. In another sense, Barclay wants to say, I'm fine talking about real things, um, as long as you understand what I'm talking about. I want to say, yeah, everything is just ideas, but we can split ideas into two categories. There are the ideas that are um, imprinted on our senses by the author of nature, our sensory perceptions, those are regular and vivid and constant. Yeah, they're just ideas, but we can legitimately call those real things. Um, on the other hand, there are ideas which we just come up with in our imaginations, which, as he said, are less regular or vivid or constant. Um, they come and go. They're kind of totally arbitrary. And that's what we mean by mere ideas. So even Barclay is willing to say, well, this is real and this is a mere idea, even though he means everything's really an idea, but some ideas are more regular and vivid and constant. So in that sense, Barclay will distinguish between reality and mere ideas. Now, here's a big question, which uh, people have 
always pose to Barclay. Do things keep on existing when we're not looking at them? So Barclay says that the only things that exist are minds and the ideas in minds. And ideas, he says, only exist when someone is having them, when someone is perceiving them. Okay, so let's say there's a tree on the quad on Greenville Tech's Barton campus. At night, let's say nobody is looking at it. Everybody goes home. According to Barclay, would he say that that tree no longer exists since nobody's perceiving it? It's not an idea in anybody's mind. Uh, a guy named Ronald Knox came up with this clever limerick to explain the objection. There once was a man who said God must think it exceedingly odd if he finds that this tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad. Okay, that's the objection. But uh, Knox came up with another limerick to explain here is what Barclay's answer would be. Um, Barclay would say, uh, well, in God would say, in Barclay's world, Dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad. And that's why the tree will continue to be, since observed by yours faithfully, God. Now, the idea here is that even when everybody goes home from Greenville Tech, that tree still exists on the campus because God is always watching it. It's always an idea in God's mind. God is always perceiving it. So Barclay doesn't think that things stop existing when you stop seeing them or when any human stops seeing them. God has always seen everything, and that's why it keeps existing.